We are living in the time of the end. The fast fulfilling signs of the times declare that the coming of Christ is near at hand. The days in which we live are solemn and important. The Spirit of God is gradually but surely being withdrawn from the earth. The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world, and the final movements will be rapid ones. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, Page 11. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you for the awesome privilege of coming into your presence. We thank you, Father, that we can be certain of your protection and your blessing in this world of rebellion and sickness and sorrow and death. We thank you for the privilege of belonging to your people. We ask, Father, that as we open your holy word, that your Holy Spirit will be manifested in power in this place. Open minds and open hearts. And Father, I ask that you will give us understanding and that you will give us uh, that enthusiasm that comes as a result of studying your word. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of approaching your throne in prayer. And we thank you for hearing us. For we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. This is the third presentation in a series of five. And the title of our study today is The Roman Element. Basically, our study is going to uh, cover the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. Now, before we study Revelation 12, it's necessary to, re uh, to review what we studied in our last study together. Uh, as you remember, those of you who were here, uh, we studied Daniel chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 13. And I'm just going to do a quick review of these chapters because they're foundational for what we're going to study today. First of all, let's review Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, we have a lion. That lion represents Babylon. We have, in the second place, a bear. That bear represents Medo-Persia. Then we have a leopard. The leopard represents the kingdom of Greece. And then we have a dragon-like beast. He's not called a dragon in Daniel 7, but the characteristics are that of a dragon. We have a dragon beast. And this dragon beast has great iron teeth. And he has... Uh, feet that trample and destroy everything that comes in his way. And of course this uh, fourth kingdom, this fourth beast, dragon beast, represents the kingdom of Rome. And we studied last time that Rome actually has how many stages? Rome actually has four stages. The first stage of Rome, of course, is this dragon beast by itself. But then you'll notice in Daniel chapter 7 that out of the head of the dragon beast, after it rules for a while, come how many horns? Ten horns. That's the second stage of this Roman beast. Actually, what it means is that Rome, the kingdom of Rome, the empire of Rome, was going to be divided into ten kingdoms. And that happened as a result of the invasion of the barbarian tribes from the northern sector of the Roman Empire. But then you'll notice in Daniel chapter 7 that we have a third stage. This third stage is that of the little horn. You'll remember that among the ten horns rises a little horn. And this little horn has several characteristics. First of all, it speaks blasphemies against God. 
In the second place, it persecutes the saints of the Most High. In the third place, it thinks it can change times. In the fourth place, it thinks that it can change the law of God. And finally, its period of rule is 1260 days, which are years. And this time period is expressed as time, times, and the dividing of time. Now we know that this little horn is Roman, because it comes from the head of the fourth beast, which represents Rome. We also know that this little horn power rises after Rome was divided, because it rises among the ten horns, after the ten horns are there. And there's no doubt whatsoever, as we look at church history, what this little horn represents. It actually represents the Roman Catholic papacy. But that's not the end of the history of Rome. Neither is it the end of the story that we find in Daniel chapter 7. Because even after this little horn rules for time, times, and the dividing of time, we notice that this little horn rules until the second coming of Christ. Now it, it becomes very clear, at least implicitly, that if the little horn rules time, times, and the dividing of time, but it's not destroyed until Jesus comes, there must be a period of respite between when it ruled the first time for 1260 years and when it will rule again to be destroyed when Jesus comes. Now I must admit that this period of respite in Daniel chapter 7 is not clear. It is implicit. But it's pretty strongly implicit because if it rules time, times, and the dividing of time, but it's going to be around when Jesus comes ruling, it must mean that there is a period of interruption of its power in between. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 13 and review this chapter. And we don't have to actually look up the verses, I just want you to catch the picture because uh, it's very important for the structure of Revelation 12 which we're going to discuss in our study this morning. In Revelation chapter 13, we also have the mention of four beasts. Particularly in verse 2 of Revelation 13, we have the mention of a lion, we have the mention of a bear, we have the mention of a leopard, and we have the mention of a dragon beast. And by the way, this dragon beast has how many horns? This dragon beast has ten horns. And then we're told that the dragon beast with ten horns gives his throne, his power, and his authority to the beast. In other words, the beast is equivalent to the little horn. I want to go over this again because it's extremely important. Revelation 13, like Daniel 7, you have a lion. Then you have a bear. Then you have a leopard. Then you have a dragon beast. The dragon beast in both contexts has ten horns. And then in Daniel 7, the dragon beast with the ten horns gives its power to the little horn. In Revelation 13, the dragon beast with the ten horns gives its power and its authority and its throne to the beast. And then the beast rules for 42 months, which is the same period as time times and the dividing of time. But in Revelation chapter 13 we also notice that there's a period when the power of this beast or the little horn in Daniel 7 is interrupted. Because we're told in Revelation chapter 13 that this beast after it ruled for 42 months received a what? Received a deadly wound on its head which means that it is tendered inactive. So just like in Daniel 7, you have a, a period of respite between the first period of dominion of the little horn and when he will rule shortly before Jesus comes. In Revelation chapter 13, you also have a period of respite. After the 42 months, a wound is given to this beast. He is inactive for a period of time, but then you'll notice that his deadly wound is what? His deadly wound is healed, and the whole world wonders after the beast. 
So we notice in Daniel 7 and in Revelation chapter 13 that we have four stages of Rome. We begin with a lion, bear, and leopard. Those are Old Testament powers. Then we have the dragon beast, which by the way is partially an Old Testament power, but it's the power that's ruling when Jesus comes, as we're going to notice. And that's the first stage of this, uh, of this fourth power. The dragon beast for a while rules by itself. Then the second stage, ten horns comes out, come out on its head. Then a third stage, the little horn comes out among the ten. Or, as we find in Revelation 13, the beast rules for 42 months. And then in Daniel chapter 7, you have the period of respite. And in Revelation chapter 13, you have the period of respite when the deadly wound is given. And then the deadly wound is healed. Now, you'll notice then that the background of Revelation chapter 13 is Daniel 7. There's no doubt whatsoever that the background of Revelation 13 is Daniel 7. But there's another passage in the book of Revelation which is parallel to Daniel 7 and Revelation 13. And that's the prophecy that we find in Revelation chapter 12. I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 12, which will be the specific chapter of study this morning. Now the background of Revelation 12 is not Daniel. The background of Revelation 12 is Genesis 3.15, another Old Testament prophecy. You see, if you read Daniel 7 and you read Revelation 13, you might get the idea that the powers involved in warring against God's people, in warring against God, are simply political powers. You might come to the conclusion that the enemies of God and the enemies of God's people were Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, divided Rome, and then the papacy during the 1260 years and the papacy at the end of time after its deadly wound is healed. So you might get the idea that these are the enemies of God's people. But Revelation chapter 12 is going to show us that there is an enemy behind the enemies. In other words, there is someone who is orchestrating the power of all of these kingdoms. There is someone behind these kingdoms. And Revelation chapter 12 makes it abundantly clear who this power behind the powers of the world is. Notice Genesis 3 verse 15 before we go to Revelation 12. And that should be easy to find because it's at the very beginning of the Bible. This is after Adam and Eve sinned. God has said the day that you sin you're going to die. Adam and Eve are shaking. They're filled with fear. We're going to die. And God comes down to the garden and he speaks these words to the serpent. And I want you to notice that there are four elements. God says, and I will put enmity. First element, enmity. I will put enmity between thee, that is the serpent, and the woman. So we have three elements so far. We have enmity. We have a serpent, and we have a woman. Now notice what it continues saying. And between thy seed and her seed. So the serpent and the woman both have seed. Four ideas. Enmity, a serpent, woman, and seed. But I want you to notice that the primary enmity is not between the serpent and the woman, or the serpent's seed and the woman's seed. Even though there is enmity between the serpent and the woman and the serpent and the woman's seed, the primary enmity lies elsewhere. Notice the last part of the ver verse. It, or as most modern versions say, he shall bruise thy head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now let me ask you, the seed of the woman is how many individuals? One. Because it says, you the serpent are going to get your head crushed by the seed of the woman. But you the serpent are going to wound the woman's seed's heel. His heel. Not their heel. His heel. 
In other words, the seed of the woman is primarily one. What God is saying is, I'm going to send a seed to planet earth, and he's going to do battle with you. You took everything from man, you brought death into the world, but I'm going to send a seed to the world, and he's going to be at war with you. In the process of the war, you're going to wound him, you're going to hurt him, you're going to hurt his heel. But I want you to know that as a result of hurting his heel, his foot is going to be lifted up, and he's going to crush your head. This is the prophecy that lies behind Revelation chapter 12. What we're going to see is that the power behind these earthly powers, behind Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Rome and its divided state, the papacy during the 1260 years, and the resurrected papacy after the, the deadly wound is healed, is none other than Satan himself. Now go with me to Revelation chapter 12, and let's examine this prophecy. Let's see if we have the same four elements of Genesis 3.15. We'll begin at verse 1. It says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman. That's interesting. Was there a woman in Genesis 3.15? Certainly. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Now we could cut, study all of the symbols in this verse, but that's not our intention this morning to study all of the symbols. There's two particularly that I want to comment on. First of all, what does the woman represent? The woman represents the church. And you say, well, why doesn't it represent Mary? Yes, Mary did bring Jesus into the world. But the woman here represents something far larger than Mary. You say, how's that? Well, let me explain. After the woman gives birth to the child, the woman flees into the wilderness for 1,260 years. You would have to believe that literal Mary was alive for 1,260 years after Jesus was born to believe that this is speaking in its broader sense about Mary. So the woman represents what? Represents the church. By the way, this is denoted by the number 12. The Old Testament church is illustrated by 12 tribes. The New Testament church is illustrated as 12 apostles. Jesus purposely chose 12. Unless you wonder about that, when Judas apostatized, the disciples got together and they said, we need 12. There have to be 12 because they were a continuation of God's church. So the woman represents the church. Now, in this particular place, does the woman represent the Old Testament church or the New Testament church? There's no doubt that she represents at this stage the Old Testament church. You say, how do you know that? It's very simple. The child hasn't been born yet, we're going to notice. So it must be the Old Testament. By the way, the crying out of this woman in travail represents the desire of the Old Testament church of the Jews for the coming of the Messiah to this world to redeem them and to deliver them and to free them. That's the crying out in labor pains. They want the Messiah to come, in other words. And so you'll notice in chapter 12 and verse 1 that you have a woman. Now let's notice verse 2. It says there, and she, being with child, who exists before, the child or the woman? You say, that's a dumb question. Of course, the woman does. But is the woman already an adult at this stage when she's going to have the child? Is she growing up? Yes. So must this represent the Old Testament church? Obviously, yes. And so it says, and she being with child, did she have a seed in her womb? Yeah, male? Singular? Like Genesis 3.15? What did Genesis 3.15 say? He shall bruise your head. You shall bruise his heel. And so it says, And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. So we have two elements so far from Genesis 3.15. We have a woman, and we have a seed of the woman in her womb. Now let's notice if there's a third element. 
Go with me to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 3. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 3. It says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon. Why is the dragon red? Must be communism, huh? That's the way some people interpret the Bible. Because communism's color today is red, they say, well, if you have a red dragon, that must be communism. That's no way to interpret scripture. In scripture, red is the color of blood. This is a bloodthirsty dragon. Because we're going to notice that he wants to kill the child. Now notice once again, verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. Is this the same dragon of Daniel 7? What do you think? Is this the same dragon of, of Daniel 7? In Daniel 7 you have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and the dragon of Rome. Here in Revelation 12 you don't have those first beasts mentioned, but you have the Old Testament period, and then you have the dragon beast, which would be what? It would be Rome. The same as the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7. There's no doubt whatsoever about it. Now who is this dragon? Go with me to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7 amplifies. It says here, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought. And then let's jump down to verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old, or as the King James Version says, the ancient serpent, called whom? The devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. Let me ask you then, who is this dragon beast? This dragon beast is the ancient serpent, the devil and Satan. Is Revelation 12 picking up on Genesis 3.15? Why would the serpent be called the ancient serpent? And so what I'm saying is that you have a serpent also in Revelation 12. And so you have a woman. The woman has a seed in her womb. And suddenly you have a dragon who is identified as the ancient serpent, the devil and Satan, who appears. And what is he going to try and do? Notice verse 4, the enmity, the fourth element. It says in verse 4, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And now notice. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Let me ask you, what empire is being described here? What empire tried to slay Jesus when Jesus was born? It was Rome. So is this dragon beast Rome? Sure. Is the dragon beast of Daniel 7 Rome? Of course. In the sequence you can notice it. Is the dragon beast of Revelation 13, who gives his power to the beast which rules 42 months, also a symbol of Rome? There's no doubt whatsoever about it. And the background here is what? Genesis 3.15. By the way, who was it? that stood next to Jesus to destroy Jesus when he was born. Who was it? Did the devil come personally? Could people see him there? No. If you go to Matthew chapter 2 and verse 16, you'll notice that there Herod gave a decree to slay all of the children two years and under. So let me ask you, who wanted the child? Who wanted Jesus dead? Was it Herod or was it the devil? If you read in Matthew, who was it? Herod. Because Herod was afraid he was going to lose his throne to this prospective Messiah. But when you go to Revelation chapter 12, which is the, in the background, which you know, moves the curtain aside and allows you to see behind human history, you see, oh, it wasn't Herod who was afraid of losing his throne. It's the devil who's afraid of losing his throne. And the devil whispers to Herod. He says, Herod, you know, the Messiah's been born somewhere. And if you don't do something about it, he's going to take your throne. But the devil's really thinking, if I let him live, he's going to take my throne. So the devil is really the power behind the power. 
By the way, did you notice that this dragon beast of Revelation chapter 12 has how many heads? How many heads does this dragon beast, which represents Satan, have? It has seven heads. Now what I want to share with you is that each one of those heads represents a kingdom through which Satan persecuted either Jesus or the people of Jesus. The first four heads, of course, would be Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and what? And the empire of Rome. Now a little bit later, we're going to come to this, and when we have our last study in this series, uh, which is called The Return of the River Dragon, I am going to share a little bit more about the heads and how they relate to each other. In other words, the heads rule consecutively, successively, one after the other, under the influence of Satan, the great dragon. He is the power behind these heads. He is the power behind these kingdoms in human history, in other words. Now, let's go to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5. What happened to this child? Who won this battle? Was it the serpent or was it the child? Of course it was the child. Notice Revelation 12 and verse 5. It says, and she brought forth a man-child. By the way, in the Greek, it literally says a, a, male, a male son. Does anybody know of a son who's not a male? I think God is trying to emphasize that this is masculine. Hello? It says in the Greek, a male son. Because it's trying to connect this battle with Genesis chapter 3. And so it says, and she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and now notice this, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Who won? Jesus won. Because even though he died, what happened at the end of his mission on planet earth? He was caught up to God's throne where he had been before he came to this world. In other words, he overcame. He gained the victory, and he ascended back to God's throne. By the way, which empire was ruling when Jesus ascended to his Father's throne? Still Rome. Now, let me ask you this. Is this the first, first stage of Rome that we're discussing here? Yes? Is this the Roman Empire? How many more stages would you expect? You would expect at least three more in Revelation 12. Now, how many horns does this dragon beast have? has ten horns. How many horns did the dragon beast of Daniel 7 have? Ten. Now in Revelation chapter 12, it, the succession is not emphasized. In other words, the point of emphasis is not that the dragon rules for a while, while and then he sprouts ten horns. But when you go back to Daniel 7, you know that that's exactly what happened. That's why we need to compare Daniel and Revelation. They have to be studied together. Because Revelation 12 simply says that there's a dragon with ten horns. You don't know if the ten horns were there when he began to rule or whether they came up afterwards. But when you go back to Daniel 7, you discover very clearly that the dragon rules for a while, then he sprouts ten horns, and then among the ten comes the little one. And so in Revelation chapter 12, you have this dragon beast who wants to slay the child. Then this dragon beast, it says, sprouts ten horns. It's following the same sequence of Daniel 7 and Revelation 13. And what would you expect the next stage to be? It would have to be the third stage of Rome. Are you still with me or are you not with me? It would have to be the third stage. Because of, we've already discussed two. The dragon who tried to slay the child. That dragon beast has ten horns. So you would expect the third stage to be a period, the period of the little horn or the period of the beast. And how long must it last? It must last time, times, and the dividing of time, or it must last 42 months, as spoken of in Revelation 13. Now, let's notice whether this is the case. Revelation 12 and verse 6. Notice the next stage in this controversy. It says, And the woman fled into the wilderness. Who is the dragon going to go after now? He tried to kill the child, couldn't. The child was caught up to God and to his throne, and so the dragon says, can't do anything more with the child, he's gone. He's in heaven already. So now I'm going to go after the woman that bore the child. By the way, can this be literal Mary? 
No, not really, because uh, he's going to persecute this woman, we're going to notice, for 1,260 years. Now let's notice verse 6 again. And the woman fled into the wilderness. And notice the elements, because we're going to come back to them in a moment. The woman, you have a woman, she fled where? To the wilderness, where she hath a what? A place, okay, she has a place, prepared of God that they should what? Feed her, okay, feed her. How long? A thousand two hundred and three score days. Is that the same period as time times and the dividing of time? Is that the same period as the 42 months? Yes. Is Revelation 12 following the same sequence of Daniel 7 and Revelation 13? Absolutely. But it's describing the power behind these earthly powers. It's describing the devil who is orchestrating human events from behind the scenes. Through these earthly powers represented by these heads of this dragon beast. Now notice, once again, I repeat, you have a woman, you have the wilderness, you have a place prepared. She's fed there 1,260 days. Now let's go down to Revelation 12, verse 14. And we don't have time to study the intervening verses, but let's go to verse 14, and you'll see here in verse 14 that it's repeating the same that we just noticed in verse 6. It says in verse 14, And to the woman, there you have the woman, were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into where? Into the wilderness, there's a second element. Into her what? Place, there you have the same element as verse 6. Where she is what? Nourished. You remember that she was fed in verse 6. And how long is she nourished? For a time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. You know, there's no way you can get this time period wrong. God has expressed it in three different ways for a purpose. He says, time, times, and the dividing of time. And as Adventists, we've said, that's three and a half years. And some people say, well, how do you know that times means two times? It might be three times or five times. Very simple. In the Hebrew, when you use the word times without a numeral, it simply means two. But you don't even have to go to the Hebrew rule. Because you'll notice that three and a half times multiplied times, how many? 360 days per time or per year gives you what result? 1,260 days. In Revelation 13, it's expressed as 42 months. In Revelation 12, it's expressed as 1,260 days. Three different ways of expressing the same time period. Now, do you have the same elements in Revelation 12, 14 as we had in Revelation 12, verse 6? Absolutely. Once again, you have a woman, you have the wilderness, you have a place prepared, you have a, a place where she is fed or nourished, and you have 1260 days or time, times, and the dividing of time. What would you expect the next stage to be? How many stages have we noticed of Rome so far? Well, we've noticed the dragon beast by itself that tries to kill the child. The child is caught up to God and, God and his throne. We notice that that dragon beast has how many horns? Has ten horns. And then we notice that uh, this woman has to flee into the wilderness from the face of the serpent. How long? 1,260 days or years. So how many stages do we have of Rome so far? We have three. But Rome has how many stages? Rome has four. Now is there a fourth stage here in Revelation chapter 12? Not only, listen to what I'm going to say, not only do we have a fourth stage, but we also have a period of respite in between stage 3 and stage 4. Do you remember that there was a period of respite in Daniel 7? A period where, where uh, the little horn is inactive, you know, he rules time times the dividing of time, then he's rendered inactive, and then he's there when Jesus comes to destroy him. Revelation 13, you have this, uh, this beast that rules for a period of 42 months. Then it receives a deadly wound. But then at the end of time, its deadly wound is healed. You have a period of respite during the deadly wound. 
Is it just possible that in Revelation 12 we also have a period of respite? Absolutely. Go with me to verse 15. See how prophe prophecy is mathematical. You know, I have a very analytical, logical mind. You've been, been able to gather that. I like structures. I like to follow sequences. Because I think that when we do that, there, there's no room for, for, for being mistaken. I mean, uh, it's very difficult to make mistakes in math when you follow the rules. I mean, math is math. Isn't that right? Now go with me to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 15. It says here, and the serpent, who is the serpent? Who is the serpent? The serpent is Satan. How many heads does he have? How many heads does the serpent have? He has seven. Okay, I want you to remember that. Notice. And the serpent cast out of his... Excuse me, what? Out of his what? Mouth. Singular or plural? Singular. Now if this dragon beast or this serpent has seven heads, it must have seven what? Seven mouths. But how many mouths are spewing out water? Only one. Does this mean that all seven heads are not ruling simultaneously, but each head rules in succession? Absolutely. I'm going to prove it to you further in a moment. And so it says, and the serpent cast out of his mouth, singular, one of the seven mouths, water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. What do waters represent in Scripture? Let's notice Revelation 17, verse 15. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. What did this serpent beast spew out of one of his mouths? Water. And what does the water represent? Multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. What is the serpent trying to use these multitudes and peoples to do? He wants to drown and he wants to destroy the woman. Because he was not able to destroy the child. How many heads are trying to do this at this stage? Only one. Though there are seven heads. Only one head is spewing out. Only one mo mouth is spewing out water. I want you to remember this because later on when we deal with Revelation 17. The return of the river dragon. We're going to find that this is a very important detail. By the way. If anybody wonders about this, go with me to Revelation 13 and verse 3. Revelation 13 and verse 3. This becomes very interesting. How many heads did the beast of Revelation 13 have? Oh, seven heads. How many heads are functioning at the same time? One. You say, how do you know that? Notice Revelation 13, verse 3. And I saw two of his heads. Oh, thank you. You have your Bibles open. Praise the Lord. There are people out there. Okay. It says, and I saw what? One of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. How many heads are functioning at the same time? One. And this is the same period as Revelation 12. Because this is the beast that ruled 42 months. In Revelation 12, it's the serpent that rules for 1,260 days. And so what I'm saying is that the deadly wound is given to one of the seven heads. Only one of the heads is ruling at that time. And it's the same head that in Revelation chapter 12 is spewing water out of his mouth to slay the church during the Middle Ages. You follow me so far? Now, perhaps a little bit complex. Go with me to Revelation 12, verse 15. Did you remember there was a period of respite in Revelation uh, chapter 13? What happened to this beast at the time of its period? It received a what? Deadly wound. And for a while it was what? Inactive. 
Do you suppose that in Revelation chapter 12, this, wa this mouth that's spewing out water, something's going to happen to stop its mouth from spewing out the water, and there's going to be a period of respite for the woman? Let's notice verse 15. It says, verse 16, excuse me. It says in verse 16, And the earth helped the woman. Who helped the woman? Oh, that's interesting. The earth helped the woman. And how did the earth help the woman? And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. What happens with the persecuting waters? Does persecution cease? Yes or no? Does persecution cease? Yes, it does. And who is instrumental in causing this persecution to cease? The earth. Do you know what the earth represents? France gave the deadly wound to the Roman Catholic papacy, but that which has kept, kept the deadly wound in place are the principles of the United States of America. By the way, when it says here that the earth helped the woman, the earth here is the territory where people fled to the United States to seek refuge from the persecution in Europe. The earth provided refuge for the woman. It swallowed up the waters of persecution. The United States drew up its constitution, its Bill of Rights. And as a result, persecution ceased. Let me ask you, is this the same as the deadly wound? A period of respite? Yes or no? Absolutely. Persecution ceases. And so it says, and the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. The earth here represents the territory of the United States. Is this all of the story? What do you think? Is this all of the story? How about we go to Revelation 12, 17? How many stages have we noticed so far in Revelation 12? Three. Number one, the dragon tries to kill the child. Gets away, caught up to the throne. Number two, the dragon has how many horns? Ten horns. Number three, the woman flees to the wilderness for how long? Time times the dividing of time, 1,260 days or years. What happens at the end of this period? The earth what? Helps the woman and the waters of persecution are swallowed up and persecution what? Ceases. How many stages still remain? Do you think it's there in Revelation 12? Hmm. And you thought that Adventists came up with all this weird idea. See, the reason why people don't have prophecy straight is because they don't study it, study it in a disciplined way. Structurally. Sequentially. This is called, by the way, historicism. It's the historical method of studying Bible prophecy. And that's the idea that prophecy begins to fulfill in the day of the prophet and fulfills without interruption in flowing through history, culminating with the setting up of Christ's everlasting kingdom. And so as you look at the flow of history, you know exactly where you are at any given time. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. Let me, why would he be wroth with the woman? Why would he be angry with the woman? Why would the dragon be angry with the woman? Because the earth did what? The earth stopped the persecution. And so it says the dragon was wroth with the woman. Is there another period of persecution coming? By the way, what does the dragon represent? Only Satan? Excuse me, I can't hear you. What does the dragon represent? Satan, yes. But Rome. All four stages have to do with the dragon. Dragon by himself. Dragon with ten horns. Dragon with a little horn. The dragon here is Satan. But he is Satan working through whom? Through Rome. Because you can't say that at the beginning of the chapter, the dragon is Rome, but at the end of the chapter, the dragon is not Rome. 
is Rome going to resurrect according to this? Absolutely. And is it going to persecute again? Does the beast of Revelation 13 persecute God's people after it, it rises to power again? Yes, it imposes the mark of the beast. It says you can't buy or sell. It will slay everyone who does not worship the image to the beast. Revelation 12, 17 is the counterpart of Revelation 13. Notice verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make what? War with the remnant of her seed. Who is her seed? Who is the seed of the woman? It's not the church. The seed of the woman is Jesus. Doesn't, the, doesn't Revelation 12 verse 1 through 5 make that clear? That the seed is Jesus? So if it says here, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, he's going to war against the remnant of Jesus. He's going to war against the followers of Jesus. So much for the idea that the followers of Jesus are going to be raptured to heaven before this time. What characteristics does this rem, uh, uh, do these remnants have? Well, it says here, they have all of the oil of the Middle East. And they just happen to be Jews. Is that what it says? Is that what the war is about? You see, at the, at the beginning, the war was against Jesus. Because Jesus escaped, the devil says, I have to take second best. And through Rome, he tries to kill the child. Through the ten divisions, he brings about the persecutions of the Roman emperors. And he brings darkness into the church through Constantine. During the Middle Ages, he persecutes the church for 1260 years. And then this power receives a deadly wound, inactive for a while. The earth dries up, the water, so to speak, that he spews out of his mouth. But then there's a renewed period of persecution, the last stage of the dragon, the last stage of Rome. By the way, notice Revelation 13, verse 11. It says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. Another beast coming up out of the earth? What does the earth represent? Did we already interpret the earth in Revelation 12? It represents what? The territory of the United States. What does a beast represent in prophecy? What does a beast represent? A kingdom. So what is arising in the territory? In the territory of the United States, which is represented as the earth, now rises a what? A beast or a kingdom. This is the moment when the government of the United States rises to power. In the territory which is known as the what? Which is known as the earth. So notice it says that his warfare is against those who keep what? Who keep the commandments of God. So much for those Adventists that say that you can't keep the commandments of God. Then God's a liar. Is God going to have a people who keep his commandments? If he's not, why would God say that the devil is angry against those who keep his commandments? Who keep the commandments of God and have what? And have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy. What is the devil going to hate about, about the final remnant? And he's going to use the dragon. And do you notice that this beast that rises from the earth, it has two horns like a lamb, but it speaks like a what? Like a dragon. What does the dragon represent? It represents Satan. What else does it represent? Rome. So this beast that rises from the earth, the United States, is going to speak like whom? He's not only going to speak like Satan, but he's going to speak like what? Like Rome. Which Rome? The third stage of Rome. Because its deadly wound is what? Is healed. And what are the issues, folks, at the end of time? The issues are clearly expressed. 
It is the commandments of God. Revelation 13 amplifies this by saying that the conflict will be over the seal of God and the mark of the beast, the Sabbath commandment. Are you understanding? Now let's review what we've studied. In Revelation 12, we have a woman. This is the Old Testament period, right? Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. Then you have a dragon. What kingdom is represented by the dragon? Rome. Which stage of Rome? The first. But that dragon beast then sprouts ten horns. How many stages so far? Two. Rome divided. Then Rome rules for a third stage. Which stage is that? 1260 days, 42 months, time, times, and the dividing of time. At the end of its rulership, what happens? It receives a deadly wound, or its waters are what? Dried up. Can no longer persecute. Is there a period of respite in all of these prophecies? Absolutely. But is the period of respite going to come to an end? Yes. Because its deadly wound is going to be healed, and that's equivalent to Revelation chapter 12, where it says that the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. And it's equivalent of Revelation chapter 13, where it says that the second beast has two horns like a lamb, but it speaks like a what? Like a dragon. Who is the power behind this power? Who is it? It's Satan, but specifically in the last four stages, it is what? It is Rome. Allow me to conclude by reading a statement from Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 581. This is where I got the idea of titling our sermon, The Roman Element. You know, Protestants are playing around with fire by catering to Rome. They don't realize at all the danger of what they are doing. They'll only notice it when it's too late to escape from this power. You know, Benedict the Sixteenth uh, made a trip to Germany. He met with Jewish leaders. He met with Muslim leaders. He even met with leaders of the Evangelical Lutheran Church. He said that his primary objective is to bridge the distance between Catholics and Protestants and between Catholics and Jews and Catholics and Muslims. His idea is establishing a worldwide religion where everybody is at peace and in harmony and in unity. He has expressed this openly as his objective. I don't know, folks, whether you realize the time that we're living in, we are at the period when the deadly wound is not healed, but it is quickly healing. We are at the very close of the stages of Revelation chapter 12. We're close to the time when this beast will speak like a dragon. Here are the words of Ellen White. She says, God's word has given warning of the impending danger. The danger of the papacy recovering its power she's talking about. Let this be unheeded and the Protestant world will learn what the purposes of Rome really are only when it is too late to escape the snare. She is silently growing into power. Her doctrines are exerting the, their influence in legislative halls, in the churches, and in the secret, and in the hearts of men. She is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions will be repeated. Stealthily, and unsuspectedly, she is strengthening her forces to further her own ends when the time shall come for her to strike. Let me ask you, what is it that strikes? A serpent. She continues saying, all that she desires is a vantage ground, and this is already being given her. We shall soon see and shall feel what the purpose of the Roman element is. 
The Roman element is the element of persecution, using the civil powers of the world to persecute. She says this, whoever shall believe and obey the word of God will thereby incur reproach and persecution. We're living in serious times. We are seeing these things being fulfilled before our eyes. You know, we need to pray for our political leaders. That God will give them wisdom. That He will give them vision to understand these things. So that they can be on the right side in the great con controversy between good and evil. You know, I'd love to see all of our political leaders in heaven walking down the street of gold with me. How about you? I don't care whether they're Democrats or whether they're Republicans or Independents. Who cares? Souls are souls. But people need to understand the issues. Because we are living at the very, very end of time. And what are we doing as Adventists? Coming on Sabbath and warming a pew? What are we really doing for the Lord? What are we doing for the growth of His kingdom? Brothers and sisters, is the time for us to wake up, to read the Bible, study the Bible such as never before, pray such as never before, share what God has given to us such as never before, attend church such as never before, come to prayer meeting such as never before. Support the church financially such as never before. Because all the money that we pour into things we don't need, all that's going to perish. It's all going to be gone, all going to be burned up when we could have invested in God's cause. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being here. We've studied awesome things. We realize we're at the very tail end of human history. Father, I ask that you will wake your people up that we might realize the times we're living in that we might become spiritually active such as never before in our lives. For Jesus is even at the doors. I thank you, Lord, for having been with us and for hearing my prayer. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.